Hayek, it's hot outside today, so I've retreated inside to talk about today's topic. It's a Marmite topic. You'll either love it or you hate it. Infrared photography. Now, I'm going to be talking today specifically about black and white versions. I'm not talking about conversions that have the false colour. That I don't touch. In a moment, I'm going to time travel back to Dorset, where I'm going to be having a look at the reasons why people may choose to have a look at infrared photography, particularly in the summer months, and how it can actually go alongside a family life. I'm then going to have a look at some examples of infrared photography that I have taken so that we can have a look at some of the compositional elements that make it work and those that really don't. Finally, I'm going to come back here and consider three points that are really quite important if you're looking at infrared photography. They're kind of things that you really need to know before you start out. Today I am walking along the banks of the River Frome before I end up for somewhere lovely for lunch. I've got a photography bag on my back. I have absolutely nothing else here, which is fabulous. Now, the one thing that I will say is that I'm not gonna be doing ordinary photography. Uh, there's obviously been quite a few big names at the moment that are suddenly discovering the joys of infrared. And I've been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, so I thought I'd get on the back of that a little bit. But also I thought I'd explore some of the compositions or some of the things that are useful um, in a different type of environment. This morning is more about scouting an area that I haven't been to before. I've normally gone to uh, medium iconic places, places that you, if you search, you can really uh, find some nice images, but not one of those honeypot ones where there's lots of them. I'm not too sure whether I'm going to be successful because what I was looking at here is a combination of old bridges, so some nice stonework, um, some uh, lovely water and the greenery. In, in infrared, greenery goes white, water can go black and the sky can also go black as well. Ideally, you want the sun behind you to give it the darkest contrast with the clouds. So this is what I'm looking for today, the contrast of a lovely dark sky, some nice clouds, ideally an interesting foreground with either some rocky stones or a bridge that's really rocky and some nice water flowing through it. But if you're looking behind me, as I showed you a little bit earlier, everything's really overgrown. So I don't think this is gonna be the area. There are other areas that have been superb in the past. And I'm going to show you some of those uh, photos as we go through. A lot of them have been taken in Dorset over the past couple of years, um, but some have been more recently uh, taken in Sussex as I'm discovering more areas there. Isn't it ridiculous? You get to know other places sometimes before you get to explore places that you actually live yourself. Ooh. I think this is a very good example of when it is not excellent to have a human being in. You look like you're green. Infrared does not mix well with clothes. But at least it's an example. Oh, this shot is unsuccessful in so many ways. Not only have I ignored many of the basic rules of composition, but I've also got a confused and messy background of foliage, distracting elements in the foreground, and a human who just looks poorly. Now let's contrast this with some of the shots that work far better. Now, full disclosure, this shot was one of the first I ever took, and it was taken on a course learning how to do infrared photography. Details are in the description, and it's Yorkshire, and I was so proud because everybody else was looking in a different direction, and I was the only one that got the cloud in this shot. Now, this is Dorset, and a lovely little chapel overlooking the coast. In this shot, my interest was on the grass and the brickwork of the building. Now, we now go to West Sussex and the Jack and Jill windmills. The wispy clouds make this shot for me. Now also in West Sussex again, I'm looking at Ditching Beacon, and for me those clouds really do make this shot. Ditching Beacon again, and I have to say, that mud in the foreground, the cracked mud, really does make that shot for me. Clouds are a bonus, but the mud makes it. 
Now going back to Dorset, one of my favourite locations, one road, fabulous trees, some fabulous contrast. The sky isn't great, but you know what? Foreground works really well and makes it for me. Now 90 degrees to the west from that location is this wonderful shot. I love the texture in the barley and that works well. Even though the sky is a bit nondescript, it works okay. Now last but not least is the same location, a more traditional shot looking with symmetry. You've got that contrast and you've got one happy woman after taking this shot. I've come back to the office so we can have a look at those three key points uh, that I want to cover for you to think about if you're thinking about going for the infrared photography route. Now, I've just talked to you about how freeing infrared photography can be in the summer. I don't have to take my beast of a tripod with me anywhere. I can walk around and I can be spontaneous in a way that I can't when I'm carrying all of my kit, my filters and obviously my beast. Now, that only stands if you have one type of camera. This is an old camera that I had converted to infrared. And what that means is that I don't have to have any other kit with me. I've just got my bag on my back and this, and I can shoot away very, very straightforwardly. Just a point here. When I look in the back of my camera here, on the screen I will see a black and white image. That is the conversion that my camera has done, or the computer in my camera has done, to present it to me so it gives me an idea of what it might look like. When I take my memory card out and I put it into my computer, it's a different matter. It kind of goes pink and white and various shades in between, and then it's down to me to process so that I can get that photo looking how I want it to be. Now, I use a plugin for that called Silver FX Pro, which allows me to have full control over many aspects of my photography. <sighs> downside, there isn't a downside. The other option I have is to take my ordinary camera and to purchase a, an infrared filter, something like this. This particular brand is Hoya, and what I would do is I just screw it into the front of my lens and away we go. It's a simple choice, really. Are you going to invest in getting a camera converted, and I would suggest an older one, um, or are you going to go for the cheaper option, which is going to be one of these filters? Now, clearly, Many of you might go, mm, let's go for the cheaper option, particularly when I'm starting out. But there is a problem with that, and that's when I come to point two. This camera here is like many modern cameras in its level of sophistication. Now, what that means for us as infrared photographers is this. If we combine this camera with one of these, we are not going to get the results we want. Let me explain. This camera has a filter which stops infrared being captured. This stops most other things, but allows infrared to be captured. When you combine the two, it is not a happy combination, and you'll end up with very disappointing results. In some cases, I've even seen sort of black screens. I strongly urge you to check before you purchase one of these, whether or not your camera is perhaps a bit too sophisticated to be able to take one of these. So please get that checked before you actually embark on an infrared photography adventure. And there's lots of forums online to help you sort that out. As an aside, if you are going to be using a converted camera, do check whether or not your lens itself is going to have lens flare issues. Some of the more modern ones, or some of the ones that you would least expect it, will have that issue. That again can be checked on some online forums. The final thing I want to encourage you to think about today is to reflect on the effects that infrared has on different elements. Remember that the greens go white. Think of simplifying your composition. Think about foreground elements that may be strong and provide some form of contrast. Perhaps think as well about your skies. If you're going to have those bright blue days with the popping white clouds, fantastic. You'll get a very contrasty black and white look. But also don't forget that the sun behind you is going to intensify that effect on the sky and the darkness of it. So I think my message regarding infrared photography and composition is quite straightforward. Think very carefully about the elements within your shot. Sometimes less is more. Also think about the whites. Have you got a very cluttered background or a very cluttered scene where you can't distinguish textures um, very easily? 
Have you got foreground elements that are going to work? I'm thinking things like a dry stone wall, uh, perhaps um, cracked mud, uh, even down to some lovely water that can provide balance um, as it reflects the darkness of the skies as well. Don't forget, moving water may not work as well, so just something to bear in mind. Well, I hope some of this has proven useful to you today, even if it's just saved you a few pounds on something that may not work in your circumstances, or if you're like me, caused you to go and spend a few pounds on something that may be a little bit different and quite exciting. Infrared photography though is a Marmite thing. People love it or hate it. Thank you for joining me today. If you have discerned value in what you've seen today, I'd love it if you were able to give me a like and maybe even subscribe. Join me next time when I'm going to be in North Spain, on the coast and in the mountains as we explore some really fine landscapes.